uh, an introduction, very short, to a man who needs no introduction. You've reached that stage in life, Senator. You know, I'm older <laughs> than you are, but you're you're getting up there. So you don't need introductions anymore. But And these students certainly know you, but there are others who are going to be listening and watching by live stream. Um, Senator Kane uh, has a long and I think rather glorious history in Virginia uh, politics and national politics. Uh, I think I first met you when you were on the city council in Richmond yes. back in mm -hmm. the 1990s. Yeah. And it wasn't long before he became the mayor of Richmond. Uh, and Richmond, Richmond uh, has always been uh, a great city, but it certainly had difficulties in the racial uh, area. And Senator King was perfectly positioned to deal with a lot of that uh, and did so successfully. And from there, in 2001, he was elected lieutenant governor of Virginia, uh, really beginning the Democratic climb. This whole thing that we've seen for all these years really began more with the election of 2001. When Mark Warner was elected governor, you were elected lieutenant governor than anything else. In 2005, he became governor of Virginia. Uh, no higher honor, as they say. And he stepped down to be in the Senate, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, he's uh, been in the Senate uh, since, well, I should also add that uh, he was uh, the first, uh, first governor or first major politician outside of Illinois <laughs> to endorse Barack Obama. Did I get that right? Yeah, first, uh, I guess, first elected outside Illinois. Yeah, well, that's, that's amazing. You've got, uh, you've got the ability. You, it's almost like you have a crystal ball, and I'd like to borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> My crystal ball hasn't been 100% successful, though. Well, then that's something our crystal <laughs> balls have in common. Uh, but um, beyond that, you were elected to the Senate in 2012. Uh, when Barack Obama was reelected to, uh, to the presidency. And again, not always easy for Democrats to win in Virginia, but the winning streak really began with, with uh, Senator Kane's election in 2001 and then his election to the Senate. You all know Hillary Clinton chose him as her running mate in 2016. And I thought you were a great running mate. And you were, you were the model dad. As I remember you told dad jokes. And by the way, there's a whole category on Twitter of dad jokes now. So if you ever need new ones, they're right, All right. there. Some of them are awful, but, you know, <laughs> other ones you can use. And uh, that election, remember, they won the popular vote. You're looking at the popular vote winner for vice president, three million larger than any other election where the, the president who got in office did not carry the popular vote. And then almost immediately, he didn't, he didn't waste any time sulking. I would have sulked for at least four months. I would have given myself <laughs> four months. He gave himself four days, and I know this, saw him. And he was already bouncing around. It was very popular and it was already very up. And uh, he launched right into a reelection campaign for Senate and won in a landslide in uh, 2018. And I should also mention, Senator Kane, I think, is certainly the reason for Hillary Clinton's five-point margin. Maybe she would have won like Barack Obama did by a point or two. Right. She won right. by five, and, and the running mate can really help in the home state. Uh, I, I'm going to cut it there. I can talk about all the issues you've been working on, like war powers, which I'm really pleased you have stuck to. And once we get past the pandemic, I'm sure you'll return to that. Uh, but uh, anyway, we're just thrilled to have him. Thank you for joining these students. They've, they've had their uh, graduation exercises killed. They've lost half of their semester. That's especially bad for the, for the fourth years, the seniors. Yeah. They, mm -hmm. they miss their friends. But they really have tried their best to do a good job. And I'm proud of them. And uh, I know you are, too. And it's true for all of the college students who are suffering uh, like this. So, uh, Senator, they have questions prepared, and uh, we'll just give you a chance for an opening statement, maybe about how how you and your colleagues are dealing with being completely separated. I mean, in yeah. some cases, it must be great, but in other cases, you know, you want to see them. Right. Well, Larry, I'm really happy to do this, and thank you for the invite. Um, Larry, the one thing you didn't mention is uh, my brother-in-law was one of his first students. So when Larry was just starting his teaching at UVA, my brother-in-law, Woody, who's an American history professor at the University of South Carolina, was one of Larry's first students. And so 
Um, I knew Larry Sabato, the legendary teacher, long before I knew Larry Sabato, the political uh, expert. And that's something I really have continued to admire uh, about, uh, about Larry. And I'm really happy to do this. I also have some Larry Sabato alums on my staff. So Sarah Peck, my okay. communications director, made sure this one got on my calendar. So look, I, what I really want to do is answer your questions or take your advice. And so let me just briefly talk about how unusual being a senator in 2020 has been already. And we're not even four full months in. And then I'll open it up. And the only thing I would ask is if you have a question, just tell me not only your name, but you know what you're studying and, and where you live. I'm kind of curious as to just where you are around the Commonwealth, around the country. So um, 2020, so it is, today is April 15th, so three and a half months. And we have dealt with impeachment and a major and somewhat historic war powers vote, and now a pandemic that is the biggest health emergency that the United States has faced since the Spanish flu uh, uh, epidemic of 100 years ago. Um, and that's three and a half months. Um, the impeachment was historic. Um, uh, I, I, at one point during a break um, in the impeachment, I went up to introduce myself to Chief Justice Roberts. We had met in big rooms before, but he was presiding and I spoke to him. And after the exchange of pleasantries, um, I just thanked him for the sort of way he was presiding over the trial. And he said, it is an honor. And I said, and I know we're both thinking that we hope it's a once in a lifetime honor. Um, you, I hope that we will never see that again. I guess I'd be naive to say we may never, but it's not something you ever want to go through. I'm glad to talk about it. I, I believe the impeachment, I knew the day the impeachment was a foregone conclusion, and it was in the summer of 2019. And the day that I knew there would be an impeachment, I also knew there was no way there would be sufficient votes to convict. But I believe there had to be an impeachment, even though the outcome was foreordained. During the impeachment, we were on the floor in the afternoon, but not in the morning. And in the morning, I was going Republican office to Republican office to try to convince Republican colleagues to join me in a war powers resolution saying the president uh, must stop all hostilities against the government of Iran unless or until there's a congressional debate and vote on it. Larry mentioned my focus on war powers, which in a way, the, the sort of intellectual origins of the some of the work that I've done came out of the Miller Center at UVA, which did a really wonderful bipartisan commission on war powers during the Bush administration, produced some recommendations that I have just sort of been working off that set of recommendations since the day I came to the Senate in 2013. When I got there, very few people were interested in the issue, but over time, many more have become interested on both parties. And we have a bill that passed in the Senate with Republican support, that passed in the House, that is about to get to the president's desk, which we fully expect he'll veto. Um, we will not have the votes to override the veto, but, but again, some, what we've experienced with President Trump is if you put a bill on his desk that he doesn't like and he vetoes it, it still often changes his behavior. He'll recognize that, well, a majority in both houses thinks this is a bad idea. He may not care what Congress thinks, but he definitely cares what American voters think. And the notion of this getting to his desk saying we shouldn't rush into another war, it could have an impact on his behavior, even if he chooses to veto the bill. I'm glad to talk more about that, too. But, but finally, on the coronavirus topic, this is unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, I've negotiated legislation now for 26 years in elected office, local, state, federal, which is a little bit unusual. And I did a lot of negotiations as a private lawyer for 17 years. And, and all of you have done negotiations. Um, we did three bills in Congress in the month of March of increasing size, an $8, trill, an $8 billion investment in public health infrastructure, a bill that had a price tag of about $100 billion in aid to states for unemployment insurance, plus a federal guarantee of tax credits for companies that gave their employees sick time, paid sick leave. But then the last bill we did, $2.2 trillion, twice the size of the stimulus package done in the aftermath of the fiscal collapse. We negotiated it under intense time pressure, very, very high stakes for the country, health and economically, great deal of anxiety. 
big dollar amount. But what made it different is we couldn't be in the same room together. I've never been in a negotiation where we couldn't do it, at least at key points by being together. But by the time we got to that third bill, 2.2 trillion, we had senators who were being diagnosed. We had Senate spouses. We had Senate staffers. And so we were having to do the work like this or on phone calls or you work on this piece and I'll work on that piece and we'll bolt it together and hope that it works. So it was very, very unusual. Somebody will write the story just of that third bill and it will be unlike any legislative enactment ever done by Congress in some ways. Um, we have now been home for essentially three weeks. Um, every senator is doing what I'm doing. We're back home. Uh, we spend about two thirds of our time every day reaching out to Virginians, the Virginia Municipal League, cities and counties, the Nurses Association, doctors, community action agencies that do work in low income communities, credit unions, individuals. And we reach out and we say, hey, we did three bills. Are they working or do you have implementation issues where things are screwed up? And here's a bit of good news. Um, we are hearing about a number of screw ups that when we go to the Trump administration and say, this isn't what really what we meant or this isn't logical. We're actually having a pretty good track record of the administration saying, you're right, that doesn't sound logical. Can, can we work it out? And so we're finding a lot of implementation issues that Virginians are sharing with me and others are sharing with their own senators. And the Trump administration is doing a pretty good job of helping us over some implementation hurdles. The second thing we're doing is we're asking Virginians, what do we still need to do? Are there things we didn't do that we have to do? Are there things we got wrong in the first three bills that we need to fix? And then we're compiling the list of the next items on the agenda and the discussions that we need to have and that we are having in the other third of the day with our colleagues about what's next. Um, let me state one more thing and then I want to open it up. Um, and this is going to be very you know, blunt. Um, the United States lost six to eight weeks in dealing with this health crisis. The U.S. experienced the same diagnosed case, first, first diagnosed case on the same day that South Korea did. South Korea, uh, with presidential leadership, um, marshaled the private sector of the country into producing testing um, kits, the full range of testing kits and protective equipment, ventilators, et cetera. The U.S. from the president level communicated that this was not going to be a problem. It was going to go away. Uh, we were going to be fine. And it was, we lost six to eight weeks. Uh, there were a couple of missteps in that six to eight weeks, in addition to just denying that there was a problem, rather than embracing a test that the World Health Organization had approved, the U.S. developed its own test. Now, that's not unusual. We've often done that in the past because we have the capacity to do it. Other nations don't. But the federal agencies that chose to not kind of used the WHO open source test and developed our own, there were mistakes in that first round of testing that then led to have to re-engineer the test. We lost six to eight weeks. Normally, that wouldn't be a problem, six to eight weeks. I mean, it wouldn't be a problem. In a pandemic, it is. And so the reason the United States now has the most deaths in the world, um, um, we don't have the most deaths per capita, but we we are dramatically worse per capita than some other nations that we should think we would be better than. The reason we have most deaths in the world is that we lost six to eight weeks. Now, the U.S. is sometimes slow out of the starting gate. We can achieve some momentum when we get out of the starting gate that is pretty amazing. And, and I hope we're able to do that. But particularly in the shortage of testing uh, and contact tracing and equipment, um, for our frontline healthcare providers, we are, we, we just started six to eight weeks late and that's a tragedy. Um, but with that, I am really glad to be with you guys. I, I mourn the fact that you can't do a commencement exercise, um, in, uh, you, ca you can't do that final exercise in May. I was a, a speaker once in May of 2006 and it was a beautiful day and there is no more beautiful, um, final uh, exercise than at the University of Virginia when the weather is nice. I mean, it is absolutely gorgeous. And I, I mourn the fact that those of you who've worked so hard for that will not have that specific experience. I know the university will find a way to do it at another time or something like that. But those opportunities are opportunities that if you've looked forward to them, 
your parents and everybody who's worked so hard to help you get there, they probably look forward to it even more. And I'm, I'm sorry that that experience, at least the traditional one, is not going to be uh, there for you. But thanks for having me on today, Larry, and I'm really happy to take people's questions or take people's suggestions. Senator, let me interject just one thing as Mr. Truth decides who he's going to call on first. Uh, there's a big movement on Twitter. Yes, I mean, I'm isolated, so I'm spending entirely too much time on Twitter. It's bad for anybody's mental health. But there is uh, a big movement on there, started I believe, by either a high school or college student. I, I haven't figured out what he is. His name is Lincoln, but uh, seems to be a Democrat. Uh, as President Trump said, there are just lots of people who don't know that Abraham Lincoln is public. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, he's trying to start a movement, and it's just mushrooming into tens of thousands of people. He's asking on behalf of all the college students and high school students who've had their graduations canceled, if they can have a national commencement address by former President Obama and Michelle Obama. They want wow. to do it. Too. Uh, and look, to make it bipartisan, George W. Bush, I think, should should be asked. Uh, why not uh, give them something to watch that's special and it will stand out in history? I think I think that is a I think that's a magnificent um, idea. Um, I think that's a magnificent idea. And if I can if I can add my uh, voice to see whether that's possible, I would love to do it. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Mr. Stroop. Sydney, you're up first, and remember to tell the senator where you are and what you're studying. Okay, great. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, That's Sydney. Uh, I'm Sydney Williams. I'm from Gainesville, Virginia. I'm a fourth year, uh, graduating fourth year, studying biology and philosophy um, with intents to apply to medical school soon. Um, My question for you is now that the coronavirus pandemic has drawn significant attention to the systemic inequalities, the structural racism that predisposes African Americans to communicable and chronic disease. Um, What can we expect the federal government to do post COVID-19 to effectively address these issues? Sydney, that that is a really powerful question and and there's sort of immediate and then longer term answers to it. Uh, And and I will say, I think that what COVID will show is two really important disparities, disparities between Caucasian and minority populations, African-American and and Latino especially, that that will show very broadly. Um, And then second, some significant disparities between metropolitan areas and rural areas. On the issue of um, racial disparity, so here's here's some things we know, but here's some things we don't know. To the extent we can measure it, it does appear that African-Americans are dramatically overrepresented in those who've been diagnosed with coronavirus and those who've died. So in Richmond, um, about 60 percent of the known victims of coronavirus are African-American. The population would be it's the majority population, but there's sort of no majority majority. There are more African-Americans than other ethnic groups in Richmond, but they would be like high 40s. So they're dramatically overrepresented. But that's just to the extent we know. Virginia data, 43% of those with coronavirus in Virginia, we don't know their race because we don't collect it. We can tell that African-Americans are overrepresented from those, um, you know, we get data on African-Americans or Caucasians or Latinos or Asian-Americans. We can see African-Americans are overrepresented, but we're not collecting the data for for almost 50% of those who suffer. So I'm part of a a bill with Senator Warren and others to improve the data collection so we have a complete picture of the data. That's that's number one. Second, we will need to start doing in any healthcare related bill, we'll need to have uh, start having very targeted strategies for outreach to minority populations, especially African Americans. I was scheduled to introduce a bill on March 24 that got delayed because of this dealing with maternal and infant mortality. These statistics are shocking. Maternal mortality, you can measure it some different ways, but maybe the best way to measure it, the death of a mother during pregnancy or in the year after the birth of a child for any reason. Um, The statistics for African-American women are often three times for Caucasian women. And this is an area where actually 
the Latino statistics are about the same as the Caucasian statistics. So it's the African-American statistic that is very much an outlier. So in, in the maternal and infant mortality bill, which we should be concerned about for anyone, if you're not doing something specifically focused on the African-American community, then the bill is not going to be, um, it's not going to do what it should do. Um, and so I think in virtually any health bill that we will do going forward, we're going to have to have a provision that focuses directly on the African-American community. I'm having a tele-town hall tonight um, that I'll probably have somewhere between two and 3,000 people on it that's geared specifically toward African-American communities in Virginia because I want to hear, A, their experiences with coronavirus, but I also want to hear, hey, how come you know, the loan program isn't working in our neighborhood or how come unemployment insurance applications are so hard to get a VEC office to take? So we have to reach out and listen. We have to make sure that we truly understand what the data is. And then in, in, in bills addressing any of these issues, there's got to be a specific component geared toward minority communities who the data show are, are being underserved or, or, or experiencing it in a disproportionate way. Thank you. Rourke? Hi, Senator Kane. Thank you very much for coming to talk with us today. Um, I am uh, a second year from Virginia Beach, Virginia, studying political science in Spanish. And I want to ask, what is your take on President Trump's assertion of authority over whether and when individual states reopen their economy? Um, the president is wrong when he asserts that he has the authority to do that. He, he cannot order um, governors to reopen if a governor chooses not to. Um, now, he could create a lot of confusion about it because if the president says we're reopened and the governor says, no, we're not, and you imagine you're a, you own a small business in Danville or you know Henrico County and you're hearing two different things, well, the chances of confusion are very high. So what do you do? But the president doesn't have the authority to issue those. But, but what I will say is the president has enormous persuasive ability in this way if he uses it the right way. Um, I was a governor. I would not want to reopen if I was not getting a really good signal from the public health experts at the national level, because governors don't have a National Institutes of Health and a Centers for Disease Control. We have good health officials, but we don't have the resources to deal with global pandemics that the federal government has. So um, the administration is in a very strong position, including the president, if they offer guidance that is really science based, using the scientists like Dr. Fauci at the NIH and others, if they say, look, here is our recommendation. In fact, the, this is my advice to the Trump administration right now. They should set the conditions, even though we don't know the day, we can start going back to normal when the following conditions are met. Now, I'm just going to make these up. These aren't, this isn't scientists, but you'll get where I'm going. When we, when as a nation, there are, we've seen 14 days in a row of declining cases, and the number of new cases is now one fifth or less of what it was at its peak, we can start to reopen again. And maybe we reopen by region because not everybody's experiencing the same thing at the same time. If the administration were to communicate something like that right now, this is what we think is safe to reopen when we meet these conditions. Every governor in this country, Democrat or Republican, is going to take that kind of recommendation very seriously. They may implement it their own way or, you know, offer guidance that they feel like is tailored to their state. But you're not going to have governors dramatically departing from a very clearly communicated public health message. Um, and so I think that's where President Trump and his team should focus, not we're going to tell you the day that you're going to open, that they should start communicating right now. This is the criteria that we're looking at every day, that when we get to this goal, we'll be able to start to tell the public that we can go back to normal. And the more we know what those criteria are in advance, it'll reduce some anxieties and, and give us a little bit of comfort. And, and President Trump and his team, especially the Fauci's and, and Deborah Burks's of the world, they got a lot of credibility. Thank you very much. You bet. Tommy, you're up. Remember to state uh, where you are and what you're studying. Hi, Senator. My name is uh, Tommy. I'm from Arlington, uh, and I'm studying uh, politics and Spanish. Great. 
Um, so my question is for you um, about the World Health Organization. So right. uh, this week, Trump announced he'd be cutting funds to the WHO. Uh, he said it was, you know, part of mismanaging and covering up the um, the pandemic. So what do you make of that? And should Congress intervene or can Congress? Yeah, Congress can intervene and we should. Um, I don't look, I don't think the WHO is a sacred cow. If they made mistakes, we need to know about them. But the WHO has done an awful lot of good in, in earlier crises and in this crisis, too. That doesn't insulate them from criticism. But I, I view the president's announcement yesterday as more of an effort to deflect blame. Um, here was something that was I wasn't surprised about yesterday. And I'll tell you why. The White House came to Congress and delivered the first briefing about coronavirus on January 24th. It was sponsored by uh, the Health Education Labor Pension Committees and the Foreign Relations Committee. I sit on both. And we made it an open briefing for all senators. That was on the 24th of January. And we, we did extensive questions to the entire administration's team about the World Health Organization about what China was doing. And we got a pretty good breakdown that day of things that were going well, things that weren't, things China was doing well, things where they were messing up, things the WHO was doing well, things they could do, do better. But that was on the 24th of January. On the 10th of February, President Trump sent us a budget and that budget reduced funding to the NIH by 10%, reduced funding to the Centers for Disease Control by 10%, reduced funding to HHS by 10%, reduced funding to the World Health Organization by 50%. This was in the second month of a global pandemic. The, pres the president's team was trying to take an ax to funding to all of these healthcare agencies. During the same month, the president and his team were in courts all across the country trying to take away people's health insurance to getting the Affordable Care Act declared unconstitutional. Now, I don't know of a good time to take people's health care away, but I can tell you the worst time. The worst time to be engaging in affirmative efforts to take away people's health insurance is in the middle of a pandemic. So, and, and what was true about that budget in February 2020 was also true about the budget they gave us in February 2019. Since the president and his team have been taking an ax to the public health infrastructure in budgetary submissions and eliminating the pandemic office specifically within the National Security Council in eliminating pandemic um, resources within the Department of State and pulling back forward deployed US officials around the world, including embedded in the Chinese Health Organization to give us an early warning about pandemic preparedness. So um, I think that the uh, announcement about the WHO last night was a shameful effort to deflect blame. Uh, but I do believe that in Congress, we're gonna do an all, um, 360 degree assessment of what went wrong. And we're going to look at the WHO and we're going to look at what China told or didn't tell its population and what Iran told or didn't tell its population. But we're also going to look at what the U.S. knew um, and why it chose to fritter away six to eight weeks instead of acting um, with a sense of urgency. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Senator. I'm Kelly Moore. I'm from hey, Fairfield, Kelly. Virginia. I'm studying public policy and government. And I wanted to know going forward as a nation, what ways improve America's healthcare system to respond to a pandemic? Um, Kelly, here, this is a, there's a lot of different ways. I mean, I think we're gonna have to analyze, again, the extent of people who have health coverage and who don't. Um, I, I have urged the administration to drop their effort in the midst of this pandemic to take health insurance away from people. I hope that they would, but we'll have to look at even if they did immediately drop their efforts to, to repeal the Affordable Care Act, are we at a steady state where that's sufficient or need we do more? I think we need to do more. The question of what more there's some disagreement on, but, he, but here is something that is really important on the pandemic side that we have to do that I don't think we've done. And frankly, I'll, I'll I'll criticize myself a little bit on this because I've been asking questions of the administration, but here was a question I didn't ask in January or February or March 
that I'm now thinking about in April that I wish I thought about in January. And frankly, it, it refers to my experience as a governor. And I'm going to talk about that. As a governor, we did emergency management. And when you're a governor, I used to be very frustrated. I would get my agencies to all set goals. And I realized pretty soon after I got to be governor, I, I can judge the effectiveness of virtually everything state government does. If it's the you know, Secretary of Commerce, I, I can look at our unemployment rate or our wage levels. If it's our Department of Education, what are our test scores like? Um, the health department, tell, uh, tell me about youth smoking or uh, life expectancy. I realized that the one area where I didn't feel comfortable that I knew what success looked like was emergency preparedness. Um, everybody else, I could say, you're not doing a good enough job. Emergency preparedness, it's about how will you do tomorrow? And how do you measure that? So in my first year as governor, I spent a lot of time with my Department of Emergency Management saying, how can I know whether you're doing a good job? And it turns out you can. What we decided is what are the most common emergencies that Virginia might face? And the most common was a hurricane. We determined, okay, in a hurricane, we should be able to evacuate 75% of coastal Virginia population in 36 hours if I declare an emergency. Can we do that? The answer was no. So we made investments on I-64 and 460 so that we could reverse all the lanes and have them flow westbound if we ever needed to do it. And then we were able to say, yes, we can evacuate 75%. How many emergency shelter beds would we need? Well, we didn't know, but we figured it out. And then we realized we didn't have them and we made investments to have them. So we knew we had them. What I didn't ask in January when we were having these hearings, I was asking, how much are you testing? Um, how many ventilators do we have? What I wasn't asking is, what is the standard? How many, how many tests should the U.S. be able to give a day? How many units of protective equipment should U.S. industry be able to produce every month? How many ventilators do we need in the United States in the event of a surge of a respiratory challenge? And how many do we have? I wasn't asking the goal question. Um, when you when you have to articulate a goal, the first thing that happens is everybody can critique it and say, that's not a good enough goal. That's too modest. You're going to need more than that. Second, then everybody can hold you accountable to the goal. Well, you said the goal should be we need 18,000 ventilators in the United States to deal with the surge. We only have 7,000. So what are you going to do to get the other 11? We're four months into this and the administration still cannot articulate what the measure is. What do we need in terms of ventilators? What should our testing capacity be every day? How much protective equipment should we be able to produce in a month? They can't even answer the goal. If you don't have a bullseye painted on the wall, you have no idea. And so we're four months into it, and the administration still has not articulated what any of the goals are. No wonder we're still we're dissatisfied with not having enough. I wish I had forced them to try to articulate the goal and the standard before I just started asking them questions about, well, what are you doing every day? And I think we have to do that as a nation. Isabella. Hi, my name is Isabella. I'm in Fairfax, Virginia, and I study foreign affairs and politics. Um, my question is, many schools have had to end their academic year early due to coronavirus. While there are a number of virtual alternatives introduced, those without reliable internet or technology are left at a disadvantage. How should Virginia schools ensure that students are equipped with the proper resources to continue their education? And how can we mit mitigate the effects of such a large disruption in education? That's a great question, Isabella. And it kind of goes back to, in a way, something I said in response to Sydney's question that was first, which is, I think the two disparities this is going to show most greatly are racial disparities and metropolitan rural disparities. On the metropolitan rural side, there will probably be some health disparities, but I think the biggest disparity we're going to see is, a, is an access to broadband and telecom disparity. So for, for a month now, three weeks or a month, many of us have been working online, um, getting educational content online, not only K, uh, higher ed, but also K-12. A lot of people have been able to get medical care online with telehealth appointments with healthcare professionals. 
So that's all good. We're we're seeing that we can do a lot virtually together um, and see each other and look at each other in the face and and dialogue in a constructive way. Um, and we won't go backwards on that. We'll want to do more, but it it poses such a stark challenge to the parts of the country, and these are primarily, not exclusively, primarily rural that don't have good access to telecom. Um, Different students in a college course when they go back home have different access to be able to access the content of the course. I've I've seen that in some discussions I've already had with students. So I think one of the long-term issues that's going to come out of this, like we've got racial health disparities and any bill needs to really focus on eliminating them, I think we're going to have to dramatically, for example, upgrade our investment in, in broadband so that no matter where you live, metropolitan or rural, you feel like you can be connected to a workplace, connected to a school, connected to a doctor's office. And um, that, that you know, maybe we should have learned that before now, but we're definitely learning it now. And I hope that will then raise it on the prior, priority list. Yep. Anna. Hi, Senator. Um, I'm Anna. I'm from McLean, Virginia, and I'm studying Anna. Uh, media studies and psychology. Mm -hmm. um, you've touched a little on this, but uh, there's been a lot of criticism about what the president should have done sooner to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Right. And in hindsight, I was just wondering if there's anything you think Congress should have done or sooner. Um, I would say two things. And one, I think I, you know, I sort of went into this earlier. We were asking a lot of questions about what are you doing rather than, OK, let's step back from this. What should the goal be? You know, how many tests should we be capable of performing as a nation? How many ventilators do we need? We were asking activity questions rather than getting the goals set. So that was a mistake that I'll, I'll put on my shoulders. I think I could have asked better questions. The second thing, bluntly, we made a mistake in trusting what we were hearing. From the White House, just like Congress trusted what they were hearing from the White House when they voted to go with a war in Iraq in October of 2002. And it turned out it was built on a set of lies. Um, and when we were asking questions in January about testing capacity, we were being given answers that have just turned out to be false. And they're still false months later. I remember one of my colleagues on the Health Committee in early March asked a question at a public hearing it was Senator Murphy about testing and, and an administration official looked him right in the eye and said, we will be at a capacity of being able to deliver a million tests a week by this Friday. And Chris Murphy said, wait a minute, it's Tuesday. Are you really telling me, let's see, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're administering tests in the single digit thousands. And you're saying in three days, it's going to be a million. That's what I'm telling you. We were being given answers across tables by witnesses um, that just turned out to be completely false, <laughs> completely false. Or we were being given platitudinous pronouncements about how everybody can get a test um, that turned out to be completely false. And we should have had a more of a, yeah, that, but that's what an administration told Congress in 2002 about Iraq, and it turned out to be false. Um, we should not have accepted some of those statements at face value from uh, the president and his team. So the one I'll, and it, once we realized they were wrong for Congress to pass three big bills in a month, bipartisan, the last one, 96 to nothing, that never happens in the Senate. That wouldn't happen on a Mother's Day resolution. That showed once we realized this is much worse than they told us, we're going to act quickly. And, and decisively, and I'll, again, I'm going to give the Trump administration some credit on some of the unemployment insurance checks out the door to families, um, uh, business loan programs. After an initial crush, which is natural, they've actually implemented those pretty well. But they're, they misstated to us over and over again, both the dimensions of the health crisis, but also that they had it under control. They were doing what needed to be done. And it turned out that they were way off and we gave them too much credibility. Thank you. Cole. Hi, Senator. I'm Cole and I'm sitting Cole. Cole and uh, I'm uh, in Cape Coral, Florida. So my question is, since you serve on the Armed Services Committee, 
What is your opinion on the captain who was relieved of duty for uh, whistleblowing about the coronavirus outbreak? On um, this, um, the circumstance was very, very poorly handled. Um, I am an Armed Services Committee member. I never interfere in military personnel. Um, and when I say never, the only exceptions of those, the Armed Services Committee has to confirm military promotions to flag rank. And so we vote on those and I determine that they're people I should vote for. And we also confirm DOD secretaries and, you know, folks on the civilian leadership side. But I don't interfere in personnel decisions. However, I was asked my opinion about this one by the assistant secretary who called it. I mean, the acting who called to tell me that he was going to do it. And I told him, I don't interfere in personnel decisions, but do you know how this will look? Do you know this individual will be perceived as a whistleblower who is just trying to help his help his sailors? Um, that you'll be making a martyr out of this guy if you do this? Have you thought this through? And he said, I have thought it through and I'm going to do it anyway. And I say, well, my job isn't to make my job isn't your job, but I I it was it was poorly handled. And then going aboard the ship and trying to tear Captain Crozier down for taking steps to protect his sailors. I mean, it was just completely wrong. Now, there is a Navy investigation of this. Um, Admiral Gilday, the chief of naval operations, I found out later also did not approve of this action. He was opposed to it. There is an investigation that's being done. And while it's unlikely that the SAS committee will get involved in the personnel decision, we will we will look at the investigation. And there may be people that are Senate confirmable folks that we will hold accountable for that. But if it's not somebody who's in that Senate confirmable category, we tend not to reach down and redo personnel decisions. But I think his motive, Captain Crozier, was acting out of the best instincts that you would want a ship commander to act from, which is to protect his sailors. Morgan. Hi, Senator. Uh, I'm Morgan. Oh, hey, Morgan. Uh, I'm in American government, um, and I'm from Floyd, uh, Virginia. Uh, you visited Hello, a couple Floyd. of times. Yeah, and you met my grandma. She actually cried outside our church when she met you. So, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, definitely the best day of her life. Um, so thank you a lot. Um, my question is, uh, I'm just curious, uh, from a senatorial perspective, um, how you feel this pandemic has did trust in the federal government? I know you've kind of touched on it. Um, a really good question. Uh, I mean, and I, I can actually sort of think of two answers that cut a little bit against each other, but I think both are true. Um, you know, people may not like government until they really need it. And then they really need it. And so it, you kind of like to complain about the government and complain about, you know, bureaucrats and all of that. But when you really need it, you want it to be there. So I think this will, on the one hand, remind people that government has really important roles and better be good at doing them. But I also think there will be a significant critique of the federal response in this space that will be a just critique. Just one little campaign theme of this, and, and Larry will, uh, Larry remembers this. I'm not sure you're going to remember it exactly the same way I do. But when I was running for governor in 2005, and I was sort of the underdog until very late in the race. I will always say one of the things paradoxically in an odd way that helped me win was in September of 2005, President Bush mishandled the Katrina emergency in a pretty dramatic way. Um, normally, competence isn't an issue on the campaign trail that's like the big applause line. But I was I was giving a fairly standard stump speech throughout my campaign talking about I'd worked with Governor Warner and we had been given an award for the best managed state in America and AAA bond rated and things like that. And suddenly I noticed after Katrina that that best managed state in America thing started to get applause. And it was not an applause line before I would say it. It wasn't an applause line. People start to realize that, you know, competence really matters. It's usually not on the forefront of a voter's mind in most elections. 
It's not sexy. It's not that interesting. Maybe we assume competence or we assume uniform incompetence, but nevertheless, it's not a top of mind issue. But when people have a really vivid example of it and they realize, wow, that was mishandled and it should have been handled better. How come South Korea, you know, had the the, the first day case the same day as the U.S., but they did so much more testing than the U.S. did. So I think that in a paradoxical way, it while people will be critiquing the federal response, it may also make um, people more attuned to, in a positive way, um, in any level, at a mayor's race, a governor's race, president's race, others, who can deliver and do it in a competent way? And, that, and that's important. I think it's an important thing for voters to care about. They don't always care about it. I think they'll care about it now. Turn to a couple of political questions. JJ, you're up. Senator, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, JJ, you bet. Yeah, my name is JJ Cho. I'm from Springfield, Virginia, and um, I'm studying politics, foreign affairs, and entrepreneurship. Excellent. And my question is, um, in your personal opinion, Senator Kane, has this pandemic placed Democrats in a more favorable environment now in winning the 2020 presidential election than they would have otherwise or less favorable? You know, JJ, I'm not really sure. Um, and and if I had really thought about it and had an answer today, that answer might be different next week. I think I think it's a very fluid situation. Look, I think the degree, if I go back to the last answer, the degree to which competence becomes a top of mind issue for voters, I think that could help a challenger to the current president. Um, I, I I think it could be sort of like the way I described in my race in the months between Katrina in early September, essentially Labor Day of 05 and November 05, sort of created a different dynamic where competence became more important. And I could certainly see that helping, helping Democrats. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was thinking an awful lot about presidential politics in late February and early March. Virginia was a Super Tuesday state, so there was a lot going on in Virginia, really thinking hard about what to do. And I, I have given very little thought to it since then, just because, you know, I, I just, I've never had as much incoming um, in my day job, uh, even though I'm not the executive, right? I mean, when you're the executive, you get a lot of incoming. I, the, the dire straits of the American economy and the health challenge, the committees I'm on, being on armed services with the Roosevelt situation, um, just, I, I just have been so overwhelmed with the tyranny of the urgent that that presidential race now seems so far away, even though five weeks ago I was really super engaged. I'm going to get engaged in it again. But I think the answer to your question, to be honest, is um, it's still such a fluid situation. It's hard to completely scope that out. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks, JJ. We're going to try to fit in just a couple more uh, before we close. Rashab, you're up next. Awesome. I'll say it again. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Rashab. Um, my name is Rishab Ramamurthy. I am an African-American studies government double major, and I'm from Manatee County, Florida. Um, I know the Hullabahoos, my acapella group, and Chris, another member of this group, saying at one of your rallies a few years ago. Absolutely. Tells me he shook your hand, and knowing him, I'm not sure if you've washed it since. <laughs> um, um, I, yeah, so my question, uh, several states with uh, Republican legislatures are refusing to move primary dates or fully accommodate mail-in ballots. And I live in Florida, and a few weeks ago on March 17th, um, for the primary, a lot of people stayed in their homes due to the pandemic, and you see Republicans attempt to trigger a similar situation in Wisconsin. Um, right. So I'm wondering how you think leaders within the DNC will combat uh, the potential for voters and in Republican run states. So yeah, a couple of things. So first we're trying to do um, things in Congress on this, although we'll only have limited success because Republicans in the Senate don't want them to be done, nor does president Trump. But even with all of that uh, in the cares bill that we passed in late March, we had $400 million for states to try to deal with the effect of coronavirus on their own elections. And, and now the states can use those dollars as they see fit. I think a lot of states will use them to bulk up the ability to vote by mail. As some of you know, in Virginia, Governor Northam just signed a set of um, reforms to Virginia election laws, eliminating 
uh, needless ID requirements, allowing no excuse absentee voting, which is really helpful if you're going to do vote by mail, uh, extending the period of time during which you could do early voting. That will really facilitate those changes, which were state legislative changes, will really facilitate vote by mail in Virginia. Um, Amy Klobuchar in the Senate is sort of taking lead on this to try to see what we might be able to do as part of a next coronavirus package to, in addition to the $400 million, push more uh, vote by mail as, a, as an expectation. The states that do it have very high voter turnout. Colorado, Washington, Oregon are probably the three leaders, although there are others, Minnesota, Arizona, that do a pretty good job at it. Some of them are not blue states. Arizona is a battleground state, but they have often on electoral reform issues like nonpartisan redistricting, campaign finance reform. They've been sort of a good government state in those areas, and they're doing this in vote by mail. But I think we'll have a hard time doing too much at the national level because both the Senate Republican majority and the president are opposed. If we can get some dollars to states, that may be the most we can do in the short term. But I would hope if we get a Democratic majority, we'll dramatically um, accelerate the ability to do for more people to vote more easily. Uh, Justice, you're up. You have a question that few others in the world, but Senator Kane, can probably answer. Yeah. Uh, so, hello, Senator. Um, I appreciate hey, that. That's a great name, Mr. Justice Wade. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I'm a fourth year uh, double in Gov and Youth and Social Innovation in Curry's Education School. Uh, and so, one of the questions I had for you that was pretty specific to your experiences and kind of wanted to understand a bit um, about your experiences and then what you would say for the future um, is essentially around the vice presidency and then yeah. understanding what it's like to be vetted uh, when you kind of know um, and then specifically thinking about Biden and who he may or may not pick. Um, yeah. Who are you seeing as being that person for, for Biden? So I'll tell I'll answer both half of them because I've been vetted twice by Barack Obama in 08 where I was on the last three and then by Hillary Clinton in 2016. And the vetting story is pretty amazing um, and, and super intense. I mean, everything you've ever said or written that anybody can find, they're gonna ask you about. And they're gonna ask it about your spouse and they're gonna ask it about your children and they're gonna ask it about your friends and your family. Um, a funny story that's a 2008 story, but the same kind of thing happened in 2016 is when we were being vetted and it is a we thing because your family's part of it. They're going to get vetted too. When we're being vetted in 2008, there came a time after all the submission of all the documents and everything, they were interviewing me and then they interviewed my wife without me. And it's a big group of like 10 lawyers and it was ours. And she was the first lady of Virginia and had been a, ju a judge and they interviewed about cases she worked on, but she came home after her interview and she wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one talk. And she sat down and looked me in the eye. She said, Tim, we've been married for 25 years. If there's something you haven't told me, I really would like you to tell me because I'm going to find out during the course of this. And I don't want to be told by the vetting team. I want you to tell me. And I said, I thought about it. And I said, well, honey, there's nothing that I need to tell you. But, but how about you? Is there anything you want to tell me? So that's what being vetted is like. It is, it is unlike any um, examination you'll ever undergo. Although in an odd way, before I answer the second half of your question, it's easier than being vetted for a Senate confirmable position like ambassador or cabinet secretary because there's a fixed end date. A decision has to be made. Um, and one of the things that's unfortunate now about confirmation processes in the Senate is it's not unusual for somebody to be in the vetting hell for a year or two. Um, I knew when it started, I didn't know what the answer was, but I knew there would be an answer within 75 days. Um, so on, on Biden, Biden has to make a really uh, critical call. And I'm going to tell you something about Hillary's choosing of me that I've not said this publicly, but I'm going to tell you this. When Hillary asked if I would be on the ticket, she said, here's why I'm asking you. If something happens to me, you would be a good president. And I think that's the most important thing. She didn't ask me because I was going to deliver the most political help. She didn't ask me because, 
you know, I was the closest to the Clinton team because I wasn't. I was an Obama guy in a way, very close to Obama. There were a lot of factors that I think could be very legitimate factors in why you would pick a VP. It'll help me in this state. It'll help me with this group of voters. Hillary really did make a decision about who she thought would help her as president on the governing side and who could be a president if something happened. And I think you could argue about whether that maybe that's not the most important criteria. It is it is an important criteria. I mean, I'm not saying it's not an important criteria, but, you know, maybe it's not the most important criteria. And so I think that, you know, there are some in the Democratic side, clearly, who didn't want me to be on the ticket then and who still fought that choice. I, I think Hillary made the choice for a particular reason. And of course, I was honored that she chose me for that reason. But I think Vice President Biden has to, before he even gets into who should it be, he has to kind of analyze how much of this is a governance decision and how much of it is a we got to win in November decision. Now, one of the realities Hillary was dealing with, there were some people that might have been politically helpful to her in the Senate, but whose governors were Republican. And if they had joined the ticket and we had won, then they would have had a replacement Republican senator, which would have hurt her in the Senate in getting legislation passed. So so one of the things that was also good about me is she knew, well, if, if we win, he's going to be replaced by another Democrat. So there was at least some political element to it. But I think I think Biden has to decide what is the mix of sort of the governance piece and the politics piece. Um, I am very glad that Biden said he wants to pick a woman because, look, more than 50 percent of the electorate is women. I, I just I don't see why you wouldn't. Henceforth and forevermore want to have tickets that have both gender and ethnic uh, diversity on them. I, I just think tickets should look like America looks, look like who American voters are. So there's so many well-qualified women that you know, he, har- he hardly narrowed his, his task down very much. He's still going to have a really hard decision. But I, but I do think that that's a smart thing for him to say. We're about out of time, so I'll turn it back to Professor Sabaton. I, I think all the students, most of them anyway, had a chance to ask, and I was very proud of them. Uh, great question. Senator, I just think it's wonderful that as busy as you are, and I know how busy you are, you would take a full hour to talk to, you know, 20 college students who are sitting at home. One of them is, is in Florida, Southern Florida, and he's only got his picture up here, and that's because normally he appears on the beach with a palm tree behind him. Uh, so I, I think he thought that would be a bad image. Uh, but they're, they're great kids. Uh, you're a great senator. It's wonderful for you to spend this time with them, and we'll be forever grateful. And as you leave, I want you to tell me how um, my favorite uh, octogenarians are, Linwood and, <laughs> and James Holton, his, his in-laws. How are they? Well, first, Larry, I'm g- they're going to consider it a huge compliment that you called them octogenarians since they're nonagenarians. Oh, they're, that's right. They're nonagenarians. Well, <laughs> what, what a I nice thing. I take Kenya uh, off everybody, particularly uh, me. Now, to call 96 <laughs> and 94-year-olds octogenarians, that's high praise. They're, um, my in-laws live in a retirement community, so, um, and my wife and has not been able to see them in person now for more than a month because the community's been doing what it should. Um, their their help is is quite challenged um and they're not uh it's quite challenged but for 96 to 94 you know it's it's a blessing that uh they're still alive and kicking and when we talk to them by phone all the time and you know what to be somewhat oblivious to a global pandemic there could be worse things that's wonderful please do give them my regard i'll do it when you talk to them not i'll do it talk to Okay, I'll do I just underestimate their ages. That ought to get me some points right there. Indeed. Not that you need any with them. But listen, uh, to Larry and Ken and the whole crew, thank you again. These are great uh, questions. I've got two more events today. I've got a weekly call with the DOD starting in 10 minutes and then this Teletown Hall tonight. Uh, so I'm going to sign off to that. But hope to. I look forward to seeing you on the road in person when it is safe to do so. Senator, thanks a million. Okay, appreciate it. Event. You bet. Thanks.